The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are gathered here to share in the supper which your only Son left us to reveal his love. He gave it to us as he was about to die and asked us to celebrate it. By your Holy Spirit, help us to know something of the meaning and mystery of this night. Quicken our imagination that what went on in that upper room around that table may come alive for us and shape us, your people. We pray this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Welcome to all of you who are here, those of you who are joining us online. Uh, this evening, Lent comes to an end, and we gather with Christians around the world to celebrate the three days of Jesus' death and resurrection. Tonight, we remember Jesus' last meal with his disciples. In it, we are formed into the body of Christ to live in love for one another and to carry the love of God into the world that God so loves. And then we end this service anticipating tomorrow, Good Friday. My thanks to all of you for your presence here this night. We continue with the hymn. in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and each other. This is the struggle to which we were called at baptism. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving the peace of reconciliation. On this night, let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor and enter the celebration of the great three days, reconciled with God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will 
and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. At this time, you are welcome to come forward for an individual absolution. Please come by the center aisle to one of two stations here at the chancel. All are welcome. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May God Almighty bless you and give you eternal life. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave us a new commandment to love one another as he loves us. Write this commandment in our hearts and give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the reading. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Gospel according to John. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children... I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. We heard it from St. Paul, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. We have a friend, a person of faith, who uh, for years would never receive Holy Communion. 
I knew that she carried some burdens I could never know. Still, I'd look out from the lectern and see her sitting in the back of the church, and I'd wait, looking out at her, hoping that this would be the Sunday she would get to her feet, come forward, hear the words, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? Coming forward, taking the bread and the wine in your open hands. But she wouldn't. She couldn't. At first I thought the reason was that she was of a different Christian denomination, that that was it. Her church and our church didn't agree about the makeup of the bread and wine, that we were, were part of that long back and forth discussion about whether these ordinary things were the real body and blood of Christ or not. But I was thinking that it was more complicated than that for her. Some of you may be aware that an even older division exists, not over the makeup of the bread and wine, but over this piece of furniture on which the bread and wine are set. It is this. Shall we call this right here an altar or a table? Is this the Lord's Supper or is it the sacrifice of the Mass? When the people of God take part in this small meal, do we, do we gather around something that resembles a kitchen table right here or a butcher block? I think our friend's instincts told her that there was something big and something powerful behind this piece of furniture that she understood and I did not. Altar or table? A table is more accessible than an altar. The table is a place of napkins and place settings, a place for conversation and laughter. The table is a place for good manners and warm hospitality, a receptive and a close God. The altar, on the other hand, is a mysterious place of sacrifice, of life and death matters. An altar recalls a priest in a temple at Passover, knife in hand, preparing to slit the throat of some beast. The altar is mixed up in the squeals of dying animals and blood flowing down the steps. There is talk of sin and death and sacrifice before a distant and demanding God. But it occurred to me that even the table this place of joy and manners is also a place of sacrifice. Where did that chicken come from that I ate for lunch today? In a different time, our relatives prepared dinner by going into the backyard and cornering a hen, wringing its neck, and plucking its feathers. Back then, we couldn't so easily forget that something had to die. The blood had to be spilled for us to even eat Sunday dinner. Life-giving food is not on our tables without death and sacrifice, without cost and pain. But not only, a, not only our eating and drinking, but also our Christian faith. I think there's a tendency to avoid or deny the realities of sacrifice the cost. Let's just stick to the table and keep our conversation life and light and cheerful. Talk about the good. The altar is for brass candlesticks and flowers, not, not for broken bread or broken bodies. But then, then comes a night like this, Monday, Thursday, and the story of Jesus who on the same night that he invited us to dinner was also handed over to death. And then we know Paul was right. Every time we eat at this table, we also gather before the altar where he died. 
He died for us because of us. Say the Gospels. I just, I just think that there's some part of us that can't believe that our sin is that significant. After all, look at us. Our good manners, our polite conversation, down deep we're all basically good. At least we're doing the best that we can. And when convicted of insider training, did the man on Wall Street say, I sinned? No, he said, I made a mistake. When the president of Russia defends a war against Ukraine, saying it's unavoidable? Unavoidable? When a, when a university athletic director was answering for under-the-table payments to athletes, he didn't say, Lord, have mercy. He said, look, we got caught. Everybody else is doing it. They didn't repent. They apologized. And of course, they are mostly like me. Me? I don't make, I don't sin. I make mistakes. I don't confess. I apologize. Who cares as long as nobody gets hurt? Everybody else is doing it. It's all unavoidable. I didn't mean for it to work out this way. The therapists tell us not to feel guilty. Who needs guilt? And still, still, in my better moments, I know that all to be a lie. My sin may seem petty. It may seem ordinary. But it does have consequences. My actions, even the best of them, come with mixed motives and self-interest infects all I do. Even my love is often just my ego in action. Can, and so can I dare look truthfully in the mirror for more than seconds? When I step on the scale at the doctor's office and the nurse asks me if I want the result, I haven't said yes for years. I don't want to know. But there are moments. Carlisle, mining an old Baptist preacher, told about the day his wife Elizabeth saw him off on some speaking event. And handing him his coat, saying to him, you don't do all you do because you love God. Mani replied, if you're so smart, tell me why I do what I do. She said to him, because you're vain, you're egotistical, selfish, and pompous. Mani left. He had a nervous breakdown. Got it back together by the time he reached Denver, called Elizabeth and said, damn you, Elizabeth, you're right. Just peel away the surface of politeness and good manners, strip off our self-justification and rationalization, expose ourselves to an all-knowing God, and even the best of us will cry out, Lord, have mercy. Our sin, my sin, is not cheap. Somebody pays. The people who love me, trust me, pay every day. And if I stop to add it all up, the pain I've caused, the wounds I've offended, let down, known and unknown, who could pay? How in God's name could I even begin to set it all right? I'm always in the red so far as my balance sheet with others goes. To love me, to set things right with me is costly. I can never come up with enough to bridge the gap between God and me, to heal the division between my neighbor and me. Somebody has to suffer to love someone like me. It will cost a lot to set me right. And so my salvation, my, my hope, dare I say yours, requires sacrifice. There never has been any kind of love that didn't require risk and pain and cost. 
especially if God set out to love someone like me. If this is a table of love, it also, also must be an altar of sacrifice and pain. God knows what it could cost to love us. And tomorrow, Good Friday, we'll be reminded once again. Did you notice in the gospel? There is no Passover supper in John's gospel. There is a meal, yes, but the Jewish Passover was the next night. When Jesus gets up from his final meal to wash his friend's feet here in John's gospel, there's no blood sprinkled on the doorpost of the upper room, no bitter herbs on the table. In John, Jesus never takes a cup of wine, blesses it, and passes it on to his friends, saying, drink from this, all of you. No, there is no Passover meal in John's gospel. In John's gospel, the Passover falls on Friday, not Thursday. Jesus dies on the cross as the Passover begins. In other words, Passover is served on a tree instead of a table. His body is the lamb. His blood is the wine. The writer of Hebrews says, we have a perfect sacrifice offered once for all, we have an altar. We have an altar. We have a big altar which makes it possible for us to be God's people at a table. And that's what our friend finally understood, I think. She finally knew She knew how much suffering and sacrifice had gone into making this table possible. And she did not, she would not take Jesus' sacrifice lightly. And yet now, now by the grace of God, she knew and she trusted that God's love was greater than any wrong in her past. And so, it was that one day I looked up to see her coming right up the aisle to the table and kneeling with open hands, accepting what God had done for her, accepting God's grace and mercy, and then she was able to go on, fed and forgiven, Now she was able to say from personal experience, right along with Isaiah, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions and that made us whole. And with his wounds, we are healed. Once and for all, for herself, for everyone, for you and for me this night, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your Son, who on this night reminded us of how much you love us. Grant us by your Holy Spirit that we may know the sacrifice you made for all and for us, that we may live with joy that you will get us from here to the future you have for us, that your life becomes in this meal part of ours. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Christians everywhere that living according to Jesus' new commandment and by his example, we may grow in our love for one another and for all people. Lead us, we pray, in ways we might serve one another. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all people in need this night that they might receive your blessing that we may be led to care for our brothers and sisters who suffer persecution, hunger, illness, loneliness, or any other trouble. Especially we pray for Pam and for Bill, for Ann and for Judy, and those whom we name in our hearts before you. Lord, in your mercy, We give thanks for all the saints, all those dear to us who now rest from their labors, those whom we name in our hearts before you. Keep us hopeful and joyful until we are reunited with them and all the saints. Lord, in your mercy, we lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding mercy. Amen. At this time, please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Holy God, you alone are holy. You alone are God. The universe declares your praise beyond the stars, beneath the sea, within each cell, with every breath. We praise you, O God. Generations bless your faithfulness through the water, by night and day, across the wilderness, out of exile, into the future. We bless you, O God. We give you thanks for your dear Son at the heart of human life, near to those who suffer, beside the sinner, among the poor, with us now. We thank you, God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his love for us on the way, at the table, and to the end, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ Christ has died, Christ Christ has risen, risen. Christ Christ will come come again. again. We pray for the gift of your Spirit, in our gathering, within this meal, among your people, throughout the world. Blessing, praise, and thanks to you, holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your Spirit, in your church, without end. Amen. Amen. Now please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. to the Lord's table.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacrament, you strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering, death, and resurrection. May this sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way we live, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. We continue with a reading from the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night but find no rest. Yet, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But... But I am a worm, and not human, scorned by others and and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet, it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and... My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For for dogs are are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. can count all my bones. They stare and and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly. To my aid. And deliver, deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of the wild oxen. You have rescued me. I I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. 
in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All of the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow out shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him, future generations will be told about the Lord, and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it.